Well, it's Transfiguration Sunday, as I said at the beginning, and the theme of Transfiguration is, of course, not the glory of football, or even athletics, or even the glory of athletes going all the way back to hmm, maybe the first Olympics, or the games of ancient Greece. No, 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 not the glory of an athlete. Not the glory of a warrior either. If you want to read about how human ideas of glory were passed around culture, all you have to read is uh, you know, some of the great epic poems of Greece, right? Uh, the Odyssey and uh, the Iliad. And, uh, in Homer's poetry, uh, the, the role of the warrior is supreme. The glory of a valiant fight and a valiant and courageous death. Well, transfiguration in the Christian tradition is the undoing of that human fixation with glory and the revealing of God's true glory. Not human glory, God's glory. Human glory pales in comparison to God's glory. Human glory is a is a, is a byproduct, if at best, of God's original, eternal glory. We get glimpses of that glory throughout the Bible. The Jewish people are brought into this relationship with God so that God might reveal His glory and have people to be a witness to that glory throughout their lives as a people on earth. So you have, um, it kind of is, that's the way that they're using the other lessons today in our first lesson from 2 Kings with the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is the prophet that shows up in the transfiguration with Moses standing next to Jesus in the transfiguration, both Moses and Elijah can do that because they never really died. They went up straight to heaven in the stories of the Bible. And so uh, that's why they can show up at the transfiguration like that and be seen by the three disciples who were there. They can be part of the glory of God because they've been inducted into it. In the second lesson, Paul says, well, there's a veil over our gospel, but it's temporary. Some people can't see through the veil. Some people can. And they are the ones who come to faith in that gospel. It isn't because they're better than the ones who can't see through the veil. It's a gift of vision. And you don't deserve it. But there you are. You've got it. Now what are you going to do with it? And then Paul says, for it is The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Paul's talking about the transfiguration in a way there too. The glory of God which faith can see in Jesus. who ah, He looks just like any other guy. Is the glory that will be revealed fully in the end. There will be no veil in the end. There will be no confusion. There will be no doubt in any mind that was ever created in the world. Who is God and who is not God in the end? Now, one of the things I like to think about when I meditate on the transfiguration of Christ, this revealing of glory that is normally under the disguise of the guy Jesus of Nazareth, that glory that is revealed to Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop isn't what is seen all the time. It's only this one special moment in the story of the, of the gospel. But it makes me think of what I would do if that glory were really evident to me in a way that my body, my mind, my eyes, my brain could handle. 
And I think it would be terrifying, actually. It says that the disciples themselves were terrified. And other theophanies, that is uh, uh, the technical name of a moment when God is revealed in some real palpable way to human beings. A theophany in the Old Testament is usually accompanied by uh, the angels. They're, they get to do that a lot. Uh, when they say, don't be afraid, right? <laughs> That's the first thing they say. Because when you witness an angel like that, you will be afraid. The hair will stand up on the back of your neck. And you will, your body will say, fight or flight. Well, here's an interesting way into that experience. Uh, have you ever heard of the show Undercover Boss? All right. So the boss, uh, the, it's a reality show uh, created in, uh, it first aired on Super Bowl Sunday uh, in 2010. It was February 7th, 2010. And it aired right after the Super Bowl was over on CBS. And it was a big hit. Lasted for 12 seasons. It got to be that people, when they, uh, uh, I'll, I'm ahead of myself here. So the, the, uh, the premise of the show is that a CEO of a company, the owner of a company, disguises himself and goes undercover working alongside some entry-level employee in the company. And then he wor works alongside this person for a week and he gets to know some of the people in that office or in that warehouse or wherever they are. And uh, at the end of the week, he comes out of disguise, reveals who he or she is, and in some cases it's a woman, uh, and they dispense rewards or punishments, <laughs> depending on how they've encountered the workers uh, that they've been working alongside for that week. Now, the, the, the problem with the, uh, the show is that you have to explain to these entry-level workers why this new employee has this camera crew following them around, <laughs> right? So they usually get around that by saying that um, this new guy has been hired uh, and it, because they're doing a documentary on entry level, the experience of entry-level employees, he's one of the features and so you who just have to put up with this uh, if you're working alongside this person, uh, you're just kind of caught up in the in the storm of it all. So you can imagine what happens when the CEO works alongside uh, one of his employees, one of her employees, and finds out that uh, their backstory is actually really tragic or uh, something has happened to them in their life that is very important and hasn't been recognized by the company. Or in the case of uh, one uh, CEO I read about in the season two, 14th episode, the CEO of Belfour Company uh, found out that one of his hardworking and passionate employees hadn't been given the salary increase that she was promised despite being given a promotion the year earlier. So having, it says, the report, having a hard time holding back his emotions, the CEO soon revealed himself and gave his employee a bonus, a paid vacation, and the pay raise she had been waiting for. So a great moment for TV, right? Now, you can imagine that some of those employees didn't really pay all that much attention to what was going on and kept on their merry way, doing what they always did, acting the way they always did to their fellow employees, including this new guy. And at the end of the week, when they figured out it was the CEO, were terrified and embarrassed and ashamed and in some cases, I read, in some of those seasons, some of those episodes, uh, that person was fired, sometimes on the spot. That's what I'm talking about when we talk about being in the presence of the glory of God in Christ when it is revealed without question, God's glory. Yikes. I, there's another story about this in the Bible. Luke chapter 5, 
uh, verses 1 through 11. That's when Jesus is uh, teaching on the shore of Lake Gennesaret and, uh, in northern Israel. And the people are crowding him. So he walks out into the shallow water, gets in Peter's boat, and he starts teaching the people from about you know, 40 feet offshore. And they're all, they don't want to get wet, so they stand on the shoreline. And it, it's kind of like a, creating a stage for him, right? After he's done teaching the people, he tells Peter, well, put out into deeper water. Why don't you put down your nets? And Peter, this is in the morning, Peter's just finished folding up his nets, and he tells Jesus, we were out all night, Lord, and we didn't catch anything. But if you insist, I'll do it. And so he does it. And he rows out, and in deep water, he puts down the nets, and lo and behold, catches so many fish that they need other boats to come and help him bring in the nets filled with so much fish. At that moment... Peter has a revelation of to, as just to who this person is in his boat. And he gets down on his knees in the boat and he says, Lord, please go away from me, for I am a sinful man. That is the terror I'm talking about. When all of a sudden you realize there's no veil here anymore between you and God. You are naked to God in your soul. Now, that is a terrifying prospect. All of your guilt, all of your shame rushing to the front. So I try to remain humble at all times. (laughs) I try to be patient with all people all the time. I try to hold my tongue all of the time. I try to be a good example to everybody around me all the time. Because I don't want to all of a sudden be caught up into the glory of God in a moment and be caught taking God for granted. All right, that's one teaching about the transfiguration, right? Be ready. That's what Jesus means when he says, be ready. Be alert. Be ready. You never know when the glory of God is going to chance upon you and you are caught unawares. But there's another teaching to transfiguration. And by, any, by all means, don't mistake me, this is not the exhaustion of the teachings that can be gotten from the transfiguration of our Lord, but this is a second one, and a basic one that you should remember, that the transfiguration of Jesus of Nazareth in his full divine glory as the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, points to the transfiguration of all things, including me and you. So in the glory of God, you don't just stay the sinful little human being that you are, the person who, yes, makes mistakes and does embarrassing things from time to time and has hurt people either intentionally or unintentionally and who is struggling with all of your frailties and failings, but you become transformed by the presence of Christ in the world. And you are moving toward that glory of God, ineluctably moving toward the glory of God, because God is working that transfiguration in you now. God has already begun a new thing in you. God has already started a new effort, a new mission, a new commission, a new growth of vitality and hope and faith in your heart now that is going to keep growing and growing and blossom 
at the end in the glory of God eternal. So that glory that we see in the transfiguration, we have to wrestle with that because it's hidden and we can't see it all the time. We, we, we look out into the world and we see what? The same world we saw yesterday. It's just as mundane as it was yesterday. It's just as cruel as it was yesterday. It's just as messed up as it was two weeks ago. And it will be tomorrow when I wake up. Where's the glory, Lord? Where's the light that shines eternal? We struggle with that hiddenness of God in front of us. But we also are given this witness of the transfiguration of our Lord to point us to how God is transforming all things into his likeness. That hiddenness is to be noticed and considered by us appropriately in our walk of faith. But when I finally come into the full and glorious presence of our risen, our risen Lord, I hope I will have the sense to react, not as Peter did in the gospel lesson. Today he wanted to build three shrines, right? <clears throat> No, Peter, forget the building. <laughs> it's all gl heavenly glory from now on. You don't need a shelter. No, I want to react with repentance and humility. I would say, Lord, I'm sorry I didn't see your glory behind the mild way you accompany the sick and the suffering in the world. I would say, Lord, I'm sorry I failed to see you in your glory walking in the lives of meek and humble people around me. I'm sorry, Lord, that I failed to see your glory revealed in the words of those who preach a kind word to the poor and build up the brokenhearted. I would hope that I would be like those good servants in Jesus' parable, the sheep and the goats, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, who are compliment, complimented by the master, their, their uh, undercover boss who comes back and says, you remember when you gave food to me and when you gave drink to me and when you clothed me when I was naked and served me and visited me when I was in prison? And everybody says, Lord, when did we see that and do that? When you did it to the least of these, my brethren. Their good acts of kindness and gentleness and compassion were visited on the Lord himself, the master says, when they did it to others. Hidden under the guise, the master all along, hidden under the guise of the poor and needy that they ministered to. Indeed, if I had only seen you, Lord, and your glory, I would have been gentler. I would have been more patient. I would have been more soft-spoken, more supportive. I would have judged less and praised more. For it was you all along I was speaking to. If only I would have seen your glory, Lord, like those few disciples on that mountaintop. If I had only seen your glory, I too would have greater faith and believe that you are the Son of God the one coming into my world to bring God's salvation and redemption to light. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.